Dr. May Barda, Director of Global Access to Medicines, Public Citizen, Washington, D.C. Welcome to you, Barda. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, and thank you for hearing us today. Public Citizen is a consumer advocacy organization with a 40-year history representing consumers before Congress, the executive agencies, and the, and the courts. Uh, my program, in particular, focuses on global access to medicines and, in particular, the problems of cost and uh, patent, patent and data protection-based monopolies uh, and generic competition. There is no substitute for generic competition, as has been noted here today. I think it's important to emphasize at the outset that in order to get the sort of price reductions that Jamie and Rowan have talked about, uh, we, we have to advance generic competition, price negotiations. Some of the other mechanisms that have been discussed the past couple of days simply don't get us there. Uh, for the past seven years, I've provided technical assistance to health agencies, patent offices, governments in developing countries, and civil society groups that are interested in using their flexibilities under the TRIPS agreement and under patent and trade rules generally. And I can assure you, based on that experience, that it's considerably harder to uh, enact a health-based policy in this space or a, a policy that considers public health than it is to tear it down. Uh, there is ever the shadow power of industry threatening to overcome the health interests of the countries in which we work, and it's a very difficult problem. I think a central challenge for the Commission today, uh, to the extent that the question is what is, to the, what is the cost to the U.S. economy of some of the measures that we're discussing, is uh, against what standard uh, can we measure that cost? Patent and patent rights, data protection, these are not uh, absolute. These are not uh, sort of. These are these are not guaranteed monopolies at the outset. Uh, rather, these are rules that are constrained by national policy and constrained by international rules in number uh, in a number of areas. And so, if we don't have a standard for what constitutes a, an infringement, we don't uh, seek to to define some legal terms. It's actually going to be very difficult to assert any damage. In other words. Uh, patent applicants are not at the outset entitled to a monopoly in any given space. Rather, they are subject to the patentability tests and the sovereign rights of governments to make use of patents or to issue compulsory licenses. There is no guarantee of a monopoly profit at the beginning. Therefore, how do you measure how do you measure harm or damage? I think this is a very central uh, problem for for the uh, for the commission and its analysis. Since several uh, problems have been alleged with India's uh, standards in regard to pharmaceuticals in the space of intellectual property over the past couple days. I would like to address uh, some technical criteria briefly. Uh, with regard to the to India Section 3D and the Novartis case and challenge, it's been discussed as whether this is a fourth uh, patentability criteria. I think we agree with MSF's analysis that in fact it is not. But there is another issue that has not been uh, introduced at the beginning, which is before you get to defining novelty, inventive step, industrial application in the area of patents, you have a question about what constitutes an invention uh, in the first place, whether something is patent eligible subject matter. And if you look at the Indi Indian law and how it's structured, uh, derivatives of known substance or substances are actually excluded from patent eligible subject matter in the first place, which is entirely permissible under TRIPS Article 27.1, countries' rights to uh, define Find inventions. This is akin to the finding of the U.S. Supreme Court in myriad, um, recent myriad case that isolated DNA uh, is not patent eligible subject matter. With regard to, uh, so this, this is an area where India is clearly in TRIPS, TRIPS compliance. With regard to compulsory licensing, countries are free to issue compulsory licenses on grounds of their choosing. India has three grounds relied on them uh, in, in the case, uh, in the uh, compulsory licensing case at issue. Uh, in the TRIPS agreement, there is a limit on grounds for semiconductors. I think the express inclusion of one thing in that particular, uh, one standard in that particular area implies the exclusion of a uh, other requirement, standard canon of statutory interpretation. So no restriction uh, in TRIPS as to the grounds for compulsory licensing. The question of local working, we'll submit more technical comments for the record um, after the fact, but I think there's a pretty significant question as to whether with regard to a discrimination claim, compulsory licensing diminishes the enjoyment of a patent in the first place under TRIPS Article 
point one, since the right to issue compulsory license is baked into the patent right, it, it is a standing right of governments to issue compulsory licenses in these, uh, in these circumstances. So how does that then diminish, uh, diminish the patent if it is an essential part of the patent privilege? Um, some assertions have been made with regard to data protection. Earlier today, we heard from CropLife. It's very important to note the TRIPS Article 39.3 does not provide for data exclu exclusivity, does not provide a period of time during which regulator regulators may not rely on the originator, co originator company's data, rather merely provides for data protection. India, so far as I'm aware, is compliant with that policy. There is no data exclusivity requirement. Finally, with regard to pharmaceutical pricing, Complaints about the price caps in India that we've heard, if that references the pharmaceutical pricing policy of 2012, uh, my understanding is that that policy applies not at all to patented pharmaceuticals, but rather entirely to generic pharmaceuticals in the first place, the vast majority of which are locally manufactured in India. So it's hard for me to see how that is prejudicial uh, to the interests of US companies. In general, I think it will be very important for the Commission to separate out the intellectual property and pharmaceutical issues from some of the other issues that are being discussed in the, in the process of this hearing. I think, as Jamie noted, it's actually quite difficult to make a case of TRIPS non-compliance uh, against India in this, in this area. And again, if you don't have a standard of violation, if we can't point to an area where India is out of compliance with its obligations, if we can't point to a place where it's infringing uh, the, the rights of companies, given that those rights are enumerated with regard to patents and data protection, then how do you measure, uh, how do you measure damage? How do you measure a harm? The right of the government to issue a compulsory license to establish patentability criteria is a standard facet of patent, uh, of patent rules. So exercising those rights is in no way a diminishment of the patent or the enjoyment of the patent itself. I think that makes it difficult to identify Economic, uh, economic harm. With regard to innovation and innovation arguments that have been made, I think it's also quite important to, notice, uh, to note that an incredible amount of public funding goes into pharmaceutical R&D. The National Institutes of Health are actually the world's leading funder of biomedical research. About half of all basic research comes out of the National Institutes of Health. India actually is a supporter of a global research and development treaty, which we think would be a more efficient means of purchasing biomedical research and development uh, globally, ironically today, the United States is not. We'd like to see that change. But I think it's certainly more complicated than asserting that India is not a supporter of innovation or carrying its weight in this area, particularly given, for example, that the, the royalty rate for the, for the uh, compulsory license in the NACO case is 6%, which is somewhat higher than, uh, than industry averages, uh, so far as I understand it. Um, there is a general consi consideration I think is important to note that we are not speaking today we're talking about state-granted exclusive rights. The state standing in and saying, we will provide uh, this or that company an exclusive right to manufacture or sell this product in, in this territory for a period of time. India has set appropriate limits on the extent of those exclusive rights. So it's, and these are anti-monopolistic policies. And to the extent that we're here to discuss competition, market orientation, um, innovation, free trade, and so on, I, I think that is, that is the burden to really make the case of where the infringement is, where the anti-competitive conduct or non-level playing field is with regard to a intellectual property in India is somewhat higher and quite difficult. Finally, with regard, um, again, to, to my experience working in developing countries, I would just like to address this idea of a contagion effect. It's been asserted a couple of times in different ways that one of the major concerns here is that India is leading the way and that we could see policies of this sort spread to other countries and, and wouldn't that be a bad thing? Well, it is incredibly difficult to establish a policy like this. You have to line up interagency agreement across the board and I've seen uh, industry influence as well as influence from our government, I'm afraid, inappropriately exercised to try and block policies such as this, uh, such as India's health policies in their, in their tracks. Pharma the pharmaceutical industry is using its rights under the TRIPS agreement aggressively worldwide to advance pharmaceutical monopolies. Governments are having a very difficult time responding in kind. The contagion effect, frankly, would be a very good thing. We need much more robust use of compulsory licensing and other flexibilities under the TRIPS agreement in order to promote access to affordable medicines uh, for all. I hope that uh, you will consider this testimony many lives 
hang in the balance, and I do thank you for the opportunity to be heard today. Thank you.